been a while since I've been to Seattle, so you probably don't remember me. So I want to introduce someone you know a lot better to tell you about artificial intelligence. And watch, listen to this. So this was synthesized by an artificially intelligent President Trump. <laughs> um, by an AI program, let me be specific, by an AI program that attempted to simulate President Trump. You can type in any text, it will speak in his voice, in Chinese or English. So in, I wanted to give you the example to show you how far artificial intelligence has come. And the fundamental technology that you see in the little gray area is how it works. So for those of you not familiar with AI, I'll just uh, very briefly explain it. Uh, it is basically a brain-like architecture that has uh, billions of numbers potentially, and it is trained on huge amounts of data and it learns correlation among those data to do things like prediction, decision, classification, and synthesis at a superhuman accuracy. So this is why it's going to disrupt our entire industry and society. Uh, but for those of you who are worried about science fiction and what if it's become super intelligent and cyborgs take over the world, not to worry, it has a very, very serious limitation this capability, this neural network, deep learning, can only do one thing at a time. That is, if it does speech synthesis for President Trump, it does that very, very well. If it does um, stock trading, it may do that very well. It determines what Amazon ads to serve to you, it will do that very well. What face to, to recognize faces of all of you who came in the room, it will do that very well, but it cannot cross. It doesn't have the human ability to understand, cross domains, strategically plan, create, or uh, even doesn't have common sense. So in that sense, it's not, so in one sense, it's like a prodigy that does one thing super well, but it doesn't really know how to do anything else. So we don't have any fear that this will take over the world, unless there are 10 more breakthroughs. And when that happens, I'll write another book, okay? <laughs> but, but for now, I know there are books out there that say that. And the reason I wrote this book is to tell you those books are wrong. There are also other books written by historians and philosophers who paint a very negative picture. And I want to tell you that's not the right way to go. And those are the reasons I wrote this book. Um, the story of this book was I felt that as an artificial intelligence researcher, business person, an investor, I have a unique 360 degree view on what's really important and it's going to change the future of humanity. Bring about opportunities we never thought possible and challenges we never thought possible. So I talked to some book publishers about writing this book and they told me that historians write better books like that and philosophies, philosophers write better books like that. Uh, but they said, Kaifu, if you will put China in the title, this will sell. <laughs> so that is why you have the title that you have. But fortunately, my publisher and I found a very good way to wave China into this book and into this talk, as you will hear in the next 45 minutes. So let me first tell you a little more about how AI will uh, change um, the industries. So if AI is single domain at a time, and AI changes, uh, AI takes a lot of data, then obviously the first industry that will use AI is the internet, because we accumulate so much data. Every day, we, we are lab rats for Facebook and Amazon. Every time you click, that's something that contributes to Facebook's intelligence about what you as a person and people like you like. Every time you click on Amazon to buy something or not to buy something, that contributes to Amazon's knowledge and AI about what you and people like you might buy or might not buy, therefore allowing them to serve you ads on things you're most likely to buy. 
So Internet AI has created all these Internet companies, and they've all become in AI companies. So today's biggest AI companies are basically the seven giants. Uh, they are Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, and China's Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. I would say these seven companies probably have uh, the world's 90% um, of the best AI engineers. Okay. Uh, researchers, there's still many are in the universities, but the best engineers are probably captured by these seven companies because they offer high pay, stock options, and a lot of data. If you ever meet an AI scientist, just say, oh, I have so much data that I, w I want you to look at, and they'll say, I want to work on it. <laughs> and, and who has more data than internet companies? So of course, they are fortunate to have so much data to lure the scientists the scientists build more technologies and products for them, they make more money, and then they get more users, more scientists. So the, the loop of these seven companies becoming very, very powerful is something that's um, both a blessing and a challenge to the future. So other than internet, who else has data? Well, every business has data. Uh, banks, insurance companies have data. And this afternoon I was at Starbucks, and they actually have a lot of data. Your cards, every time you scan, that's a signature of what you bought, where, and when. Uh, so those companies used to treat data as a cost center, right? A bank feels like it has to archive all the customer's data just because for legal and accountability and those kinds of reasons. So every year, millions of dollars goes into the data center to store that data. But today, that data suddenly becomes gold mine because for a bank, by accumulating all those data uh, from an individual customer, it is then able to able target products at the customer. Uh, if you have a new CD or a new mutual fund, you know who are the customers who might buy it and how to sell it to them because you know what they've done in the past. And if you want to check on credit card fraud, uh, whether someone will re uh, repay a loan uh, or asset allocation, those are all things you can do much better having that data as a gold mine, and you can imp dramatically improve. For example, one of the companies we fund called uh, Fourth Paradigm, what they did was they uh, went into a bank and said, we want to implement AI for you. And the bank was scared and said, well, I can't put that in any of my mission critical things. And they said, well, how about, you know, your bank spams me all the time with text messages, trying to sell me bank products. They said, yeah. He says, well, I can target your spam better. And they said, well, how will you do that? He says, well, on your customer profile and list profile, I can estimate what customers are more likely to convert when you send that message. And the bank said, okay, there's no downside. After all, it's just spam mail. And uh, I call it spam. I'm sure the bank has a better term for it. <laughs> but we think it's spam, right? Uh, then the bank tried it, and then 65% uh, increased conversion. So before they sent 10,000 messages, maybe um, 100 people buy it. Now 165 people buy it. Suddenly the bank made a lot of money on just doing something very simple without taking any risk. Then they increasingly bought more of the products. So you can extrapolate that to other domains of businesses. Uh, so wave one and wave two are both using big data AI. And what about something more than big data? Well, wave three is actually digitizing the physical world. The data that used to be transient <clears throat> in the world, for example, watching this lecture, it's gone after my talk, can now be captured and turned into training data to make something very smart. For example, those two gentlemen back there are capturing my video, so they probably can use my video to uh, build a new video with me or do something that's different. Um, and ex actual examples of that includes <laughs> things that you're in Seattle, so you probably all know Amazon Go, right? That's an example of digitizing the physical world. They put sensors and cameras in the store, so they recognize people who walked in, what items they picked up, what items they bought, and then they just walk out without having a cashier or any salesperson. It becomes an autonomous store on the basis of things that were transient, near, namely what happened in the store is not, what used to be not stored. Now they not only store it, but they turn it into understanding the customer and also targeting products to the customer, as well as checking out products the person took with them. 
So that's an example of digitizing the physical world. Another also Amazon example is Amazon Echo, the fact that uh, it's capturing the speech of what you said, and there's a lot of useful information that it can do, not only giving you what you want, delivering the music you want played, buying the product you want bought, but also understanding you better through capturing the physical world. So it is essentially adding eyes and ears to the AI. So it now, now has eyes and ears. The fourth wave is when the AI actually has hands and legs, feet and fingers. So it can walk and manipulate and move. That doesn't mean the robot actually has physical two-legged or two-legged. It could be running on a base, uh, on wheels, but whatever it takes to get the job done. So where can that be applied? Well, the biggest application is clearly autonomous vehicles. That's the huge one uh, that we see, Waymo and Uber and Tesla, and a bunch of companies we invested in are making great progress in. And that will change the world in much more dramatic ways than the earlier examples. Because when you think about autonomous vehicles, they are not just a button on the Tesla you push and let it drive for you for a few minutes on the highway. That is not the way autonomous vehicles will be. The ultimate autonomous vehicle will be the um, shared economy, electrical vehicle, and um, uh, autonomous vehicle um, all merged into one so that none of us have to buy cars anymore. You, did you know that c the car is the worst investment that you probably made? Because you buy it, 96% of the time it's sitting idle, depreciating. 4% of the time it's giving you some purpose, taking you from place A to place B. But if there were an Uber that is uh, available in 30 seconds, much faster than your parking, and always available and never misses, and probably one half the price, and, and safer, better driver than you, would you still buy a car, right? And when that happens, it change, everything changes. Uh, people will tilt towards an autonomous environment where more and more cars are autonomous. When cars are autonomous, they will start to talk to each other so that there will be much fewer accidents. First, AI will gather more data so they will learn, oh, that's a person, that's a person, so they'll get better and not um, uh, accidentally hitting people. And cars will talk to each other about um, where the location they are. So they could miss each other by one centimeter. The, you're inside, probably scared to death, but it's actually <laughs> really, really safe. And the next thing that will happen is humans will be disallowed to drive uh, on public roads. That's inevitable because just like uh, you can't ride a horse on the highway, that's endangering other people. Uh, that is what the future will be. If, for those of you who love to drive, uh, just like there are farms in which you can ride horses, there will be, <laughs> there will be uh, speedways where you can still drive a car. That's probably 20 to 30 years away. It's not that imminent, but it's also definitely inevitable because I think, as you know, the critical mass of these autonomous vehicles, they become better and better, and then we just want to get out of the way and enjoy a better life. So what that will bring about is we save money because we don't waste money buying cars. Uh, our lives, a lot fewer people will die, and the emissions will be much better because of no gasoline. Um, and uh, also, all the deliveries will change. All the transport, getting, uh, you know, today you have to pay Amazon Prime. In the future, that price will go way down. You can get groceries delivered to you. You can get, get lobsters delivered to you. Uh, you know, today the lobsters might take you know, three days because a human has to sleep while tra driving it from east coast to west coast. In the future, autonomous vehicles don't sleep. So all that will disrupt the, drive, uh, the entire aut automotive industry. And, and that's inevitable because you see capital going into it. You see talent going into it. The smartest engineers you know are probably working on autonomous vehicles. Ask any company that's doing it whether that's the case. And if smart people are working on it, large money, amount of money is going into it, and also, the, um, all the companies have given up. You don't see any um, traditional car companies still fighting autonomous driving. They're, they admit and they accept and acknowledge that one day this will come. So it is inevitable. And that will create, potentially, an operating system. Because if an autonomous vehicle can drive, it can do all kinds of things. It can be a robot. So that may be the next big operating system after PC and Android. The next one might be 
autonomous vehicle and robot. But it won't be that easy because it, it's going to take a long time. So coming back to robots, that's another big area. We believe robots will happen first in industrial environments, then in commercial, and finally in the home. Because robotics is actually very tricky and very expensive. Autonomous vehicles, uh, similarly, are very expensive at first, and price comes down. You see the price of the original Teslas and the Teslas now is a very good demonstration that with volume, price comes down. So the first demonstration of robotics will be in manufacturing, replacing assembly line workers. Uh, it's going to be in areas um, such as doing um, repeated tasks on things like dishwashers, fruit pickers. Those will be robotics. Um, do you want a ro robotic dishwasher? Who wants to buy one? You know, how, you know what, how that works? It's not like a dishwasher. A robotic dishwasher is you take all the leftover from the table and just dump it in this big machine, and all comes out with the dishes stacked, bowls stacked, forks stacked, all cleaned and also high temperature sanitized, and all the garbage uh, divided into recycle bins. Now who wants that? Everybody wants that. So it's, okay, good news, we invested in such a company called Dishcraft, and it's, the product will come out at $300,000 a piece. <laughs> so anybody still want it? <laughs> but what this demonstrates is just that it will get used at the high end first, and then price will come down with volume. So who's going to buy from the high end? Imagine a very top restaurant. I don't know what's a good example. Uh, my re memory of Seattle, how about like Daniels and Bellevue? right? They probably employ five dishwashers, right? Uh, human dishwashers. And one such machine amortized over a year and a half is probably about the cost of those human dishwashers. And now you don't have to worry about uh, people not showing up at work, dishes piling up, or people injuring themselves with the jet, high, high pressure jet hot water. So, and then once they sell to the, you know, 300 Daniels in America, uh, then the price comes down to 100,000, they'll sell a lot more, and it keeps going down. Eventually, maybe in 10 years, you'll get to buy your $1,000 home robot that washes all your dishes. So all this is going to happen, and each wave will probably create on the order of 5 to 10% of GDP to our economy. Wave 4 may be higher, may, wave 2 may be, may be the same, I don't know, but on the order of 5 to 10%. And also along the way, you probably know this, this place, 5 to 10% of our jobs. So that's the benefit and the challenges that we'll face. So this is last I'm going to talk about AI. Next is the part <coughs> that, oh, one more is that to, for AI to work, uh, the following five conditions have to hold. You have to have a lot of data, uh, good tagging, uh, so it's not just random data. You have to tell it this is uh, John's face or Mary's face or this is a defaulted loan or a non-defaulted loan, and then only works in one domain and lots of compute power and then some AI experts. If you've got these five things, you're all set. Uh, and, and now it comes to, okay, who's, who's ahead, US or China? This seems to be the only question the media wants to ask me, so I'm just gonna get it out of the way and answer it and then tell you why it's irrelevant, okay? Um, the answer is, U.S. is by far ahead in research. You list the top AI researchers, they're all Americans or Canadians, no exception. There's zero Chinese or actually zero non-American, non-Canadian. They're all Americans and Canadians. In fact, not only is America way ahead in research, America has been ahead in every core technology. Silicon Valley has been at the center of the world and the only leader as the, world, the rest of the world simply uses its products. But China has really changed in the last 10 years. And this is an important part of, of the book of how China managed to challenge this US hegemony. This challenge began with this cycle. China has a huge market which attracted a lot of money. And then VCs go into the market and they get smarter and help entrepreneurs. The entrepreneurs are tenacious in China, and I'll give you examples later. And then they build great companies which have great products and business models that get more users. And with more users, more money comes in. So as China's internet over the past 10 years went from about uh, 150 million people to 800 million people, uh, the opportunity really has blossomed. 
we're at a stage now where the total China internet company valuation is roughly equal to the total uh, consumer internet uh, company valuation in the US, about one to one. And I think China will get bigger uh, for reasons I'm, I'm going to tell you. And this is all pre-AI, okay? But this is relevant, so hold on to the thought. I'll explain how it relates to AI. This is before AI has come about, in the last 10 years, China has basically created an equally valued internet, mobile internet space. And that has led to actually not just companies that are valuable. What you read in the newspaper is that um, ch Chinese government protects local entrepreneurs and uh, uh, they steal American IP and uh, block American companies from entering. So that's how the value is created. But that is the wrong characterization. I'm not saying none of those accusations are true. In specific cases, I think those may have been true. But actually what happened was the Chinese entrepreneurs initially copied the American business model because the China market was at the time too small. It was only 20 years ago when U.S. internet penetration was 150 times that of China. So what are the Chinese entrepreneurs to do but to reference the models that exist in America. That's how China's Google, China's Amazon, China's eBay came about initially. I don't think that equates to uh, infringement of IP. That's just looking at the UI and then, and then copying it. It is what Facebook did to Snapchat. Okay, some people may not like it, but it's not illegal. So that was how China got started. But that's actually unimportant today because where China actually got to in the last 10 years is it has come up with a completely separate, valid, and, and interesting, and extremely valuable way of entrepreneurship. I don't have enough time to go into every detail tonight, so I'll just give you one example. So these are kind of the differences, but I'll give you one example that's very striking because I recently talked to the CEO of Yelp. And uh, uh, the company that's closest to Yelp is a company called Mei, Mei Tuan Dianping. And actually, Dianping was originally a copycat of Yelp, for those of you who are familiar with the products. We all love Yelp. Yelp is a good product. It is developed on the basis. People will eat the way they eat. And here is a wonderful review guide that will help us better match what we like to eat. So it's a great product. It's a company worth $4 billion. Wonderful. But the Chinese company, Mei Tuan Dianping, is something completely different. It may have begun with concepts of Yelp and concepts of Groupon, but it evolved into a $55 billion co company valuation. So it's um, um, you know, more than 10 times that of Yelp. Now how, how can that be possible? Because Mei Tuan's CEO dared to change the way people eat. It wasn't, you eat the way you eat, here's a layer of software. It was, what does it take to change the way people eat? Um, and the specific goal he went after is food delivery to the home, meal delivery to the home. And that sounds like a pretty boring, ugly technical problem. But actually, he went into detail and found out that people would order a lot more takeout delivery to the home if it could be delivered in 30 minutes uh, while the food is still hot, including cooking time and costs not more than 70 cents. So most American entrepreneurs say, well, that's impossible. Let's move on and work on another AI technology, right? But the Chinese entrepreneur said, no, I'm going to work really hard, use my operational excellence to iteratively take some money from the VC, do some experiments, see if it works. If it works, do more of it. If it doesn't work, throw it away. Essentially, iteratively using the uh, I, uh, you know, uh, iteratively testing ideas until he got to the goal. If he doesn't get to the goal, he'll just keep going. So are, there are huge risks in taking that approach because they currently do 25 million deliveries per day. So if your 70 cents is not 70 cents, but $2.70, then that means you're losing $2 per delivery or $50 million a day. Imagine how large a you know, bleeding that is to a company. So that's the level of risk and that the Chinese entrepreneur is willing to take. And then how did he eventually solve the problem? 
through a combination of AI technology and really just brute force operational excellence. He ended up building a fleet of 600,000 delivery people who rode electrical mopeds. That was the only cheap enough vehicle that could get to the 70 cents per, per delivery and organized a battery changing station for these um, electrical mopeds because they're such cheap mopeds, their batteries keep running out. So he had to build all that and manage the 600,000 people. Uh, and these 600,000 people are not your usual um, assembly line worker or Uber driver. They're usually people who cannot get those jobs. They're, because how, that's the only way you can get to the 70 cents per delivery. Yet, you have to make sure your customers are safe. These people are, are, are in, innocuous, and then they can be trained to have present your brand and company and be courteous to customers. Imagine the training and the management it takes for these extremely minimum wage paid people to be riding on the electrical mopeds with the changing uh, batteries, how much pain that is, and the risk you're taking if you don't get to 70 cents, because you'll bleed to death with the amount of money you burn every day. And on top of that, of course, there's AI. There's computing the algorithm of who should take which order to which home and change batteries when. So that's a complex equation you can imagine. Um, it's actually like Uber, but tougher, because Uber is getting a person from place A to place B. Here you have to go get the food and delivery, and maybe get more food along the way and deliver more. So it's a more complex algorithm. There's also incentives involved. It's like Uber has surge pricing, right? You all hate that, right? Uh, this has surge pricing too. What if there are not enough people to deliver the food right now? Well, you incent some people so that they come. You, they get a little thing on their screen that says, your hourly wage has been doubled. Will you please come get up and deliver the food? So that's the complication, right? That's the Chinese style. And why would a Chinese company go through, take that much risk to build such a heavy, ugly, risky company? The reason is when you have a lot of copycats around you. When copying is not frowned upon, you need to build a business model that cannot be copied. So what's a business model that cannot be copied? You know, an idea like a Groupon and Yelp can obviously be copied, but if you have 600,000 people in operational excellence and it would cost someone $10 billion to replicate and kill you, then you have something that's almost uncopyable. So they did that, no one could beat them, so they won, got, um, got listed publicly in Hong Kong, $55 billion. But I'll, I'll, I'm going, this is the first audience I'm going to make this prediction. The game is not over. Alibaba is going to spend $10 billion to rebuild that network. And we will see who wins at the end. We, I don't know. But this is the competition in China. And that, and that leads to businesses with impregnable business models. And that's something that I think Harvard Business School case study will study one day and revere. Even though it doesn't have the brilliance and the light bulb of a Steve Jobs, it leads to models that are arguably more sustainable. So hopefully that's uh, clear how it's a different model worth studying. And uh, my book will give you a lot more details and many other examples. So because of that spirit and that business model, in the past eight years, China has gone from copying from the US and then inspired by the US but and then leapfrog. For example, those of you who use WeChat probably know it's much better than WhatsApp. Agree? <laughs> those of you who use Weibo probably know it's better than Twitter. OK, maybe not in the diversity of content, <laughs> <clears throat> but in the product design and usability, right? And then uh, there are a lot of others. Zhuhu, our investment, is uh, probably better than Quora. Um, and uh, Taobao is better than eBay, and so on and so forth. But that was only the second stage. Now China has reached a new stage where all these companies that I am not going to describe to you because it would just take too long because none of them are based on U.S. inspirations anymore. Their brand, the Chinese entrepreneurs have been trained in the first phase and excelled in the second phase, 
and now they're using the Chinese business model to create brand new business models in the third phase. And that's why China is a force to be reckoned with and respected. Uh, there may have been wrongdoings in the early stages. Uh, there may have been issues. There may have been scrappiness. There may have been the lack of experience and innovation. But today, it is every bit equal to the American companies. And many of the Chinese companies are being copied from China to Southeast Asia and other, and other places. So that has led to entrepreneurs who are extremely hardworking and tenacious and they know how to raise money because, uh, uh, you know, Mei Tuan has raised billions of dollars uh, telling stories and eventually delivering. And also incredibly hardworking. So 996 means 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week. And this was a slogan of a, chi a certain Chinese unicorn that said, we value work-life balance. Come work for us. We're only 996. That company is also now listed in Hong Kong, worth tens of billions of dollars. Okay, so coming back to AI. So now we've got these great companies, great entrepreneurs, and they're ready for AI because AI is all about iterating and getting more data. So they're the perfect group of people and companies to use and expand AI. So the third thing that China has is more money is going into China. Uh, in, there are more money in 2017 invested in China AI than US AI. And the equivalent speech recognition company is worth more, um, before worth less and now worth more than the equivalent US company. And uh, if I could brag a little bit, Sinovation Ventures, we were the first to invest in AI only four years ago. Uh, these companies were all founded between the last two and four years. And there are currently five unicorns valued at over 21 billion. And these are pure AI companies. I'm not giving you internet companies that's gone AI. These are core AI, pure AI companies that do nothing but AI. So you can see, I, I don't know if we can find that much value in Silicon Valley today in terms of AI companies. So that's why China has gone really far ahead with the entrepreneurs, the engineers, and the business models, and the data, which is very important. Um, also, AI is going through a transition. In the early phases, maybe five to ten years ago, uh, AI is about early adopter, about researcher-driven, about PhDs who are so rare, without them, there's no company, so the expert is the most important. During those phases, Advantage went to the U.S. for creating um, AI companies. But in the past five years, as technologies like deep learning matured, we've entered the era of application, where it's more about finding where AI can be used and how to build an AI product and sell it to the right people um, and collect a lot of data um, and, and build a valuable company worth money. And there, the advantage would go to China. And that is an important shift that's important to recognize. So some of you might say, hey, wait a minute. Is research not important anymore? Well, of course, research comes in cycles the next breakthrough might shift the advantage back to the US. Uh, but, but if we look at the last 62 years of AI, there has been one breakthrough, and that's deep learning 10 years ago. We have not seen another equivalent breakthrough in the last 10 years. So to predict the cycle is coming in the next two, three, four, five years is possible, but maybe a little overly ambitious. <clears throat> and we talked about uh, data being important. Uh, this is a typical graph on the right. Uh, five diff four different algorithms, each performing differently, but when you have more data, they all perform well. So it kind of goes to show you can have your super researcher, but if another country or company has more data, they will usually beat you. And if in the age of AI, uh, data is the new oil, then China is the new Saudi Arabia. And in China has depth and China has breadth. Breadth means more users, period. Depth means per user, there are more, there's more data. Data like food delivery, like the Meituan example. Data like payment. Data like shared bicycle rides. Uh, there are 10, 50, 300 times more than US, multiplied by a three times more uh, user advantage. So the mobile payment is an important one to talk about. Chinese mobile payment exceeded the China GDP. That would seem incredulous. What that means is, uh, people don't carry cash anymore in China. Uh, people don't use much uh, credit cards in China. 
which means those of you who have not been to China, please be careful when you go because you might be stranded. <laughs> because if you, have, you have bring out this cash, no one will take it. Uh, a, lot of, actually, a lot of people won't take it. And the credit cards, some, the larger stores will take it, but there are many places you can't use it. So for the Chinese, though, this is a huge convenience. What this means is 700 million people are connected to each other, fully connected, not to merchants, but to people. Anyone can pay anyone. Uh, as little as 15 cents, I can pay someone. And then the commission is basically zero. Okay, it, it might be one-tenth of a percent at times, but generally it's zero, somewhere between zero and one-tenth of a percent. Compared to credit card companies, which are really the parasite in the American economy, they're not really adding value. This stuff works. You guys should get rid of credit cards. <laughs> but it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. Um, but what this really means for the Chinese economy is the following things. First, with respect to AI, this is a ton of training data. People's spending pattern is so much more valuable than their clicking pattern. That's obvious, right? Clicking doesn't necessarily mean you're committed. Paying definitely does. So getting everybody's payment is important. That's why Alibaba and Tencent, I think the companies still have room to grow. But it's not just their data. It's also data that's, that if you have a chain of uh, convenience stores, you're also collecting data, knowing more about your customers because they use the mobile payment to pay you, so you have that track record, that record as well. So it's great for data, great for AI. It also will turn a savings economy to a spending economy because it's so easy to pay. It also gives, brings huge efficiency because you don't have to take that credit card and swipe and do anything with it. Um, also, it's very advanced. I mean, one of the things I hate when I come to the U.S. is when I use my credit card. Uh, they'll think I, because I suddenly appeared in a different country, there might be fraud. They'll call me and ask for my pet's name and what high school I went to, <laughs> right? <laughs> in China, actually, you know how it's done? When you use mobile pay, uh, also triggers come up. So Alibaba and Tencent will say, oh, oh, this might be someone who stole another person's phone. But what do they do? They actually don't harass me with questions. They say, please scan your face. And then I just scan my face, and they say, oh, that looks like Kai Fu. Order goes through. So you might say, what if I hold up a picture and, and do that? It doesn't work because they'll say, open your mouth, turn to the left, say this. So they've come up with ways. It's so much more convenient than remembering, uh, you know, what's my favorite sports or something like that. So it's tremendous uh, a con con convenience that's afforded to China as well. Um, and a lot of uh, data for AI. And one last thing, it's great for entrepreneurism. Because earlier, you have to accumulate a lot of eyeballs in order to build an internet product. And then figure out monetization later. Remember that? Uh, most comp internet companies started that way. They just got a lot of users and they said, well, we'll, we'll here's our business model. We'll figure out business model later. But you don't have to. If you have mobile payment, if you have 10, just 1,000 users, you can charge them $10 each, and you might break even for the first month in your operations because it's so easy to pay, people are inclined to pay. And, and another time, or in the book, there are examples of how the Chinese paying patterns are changing dramatically. So that is a big deal, and that, that is data advantage for China. Uh, the last advantage is a government advantage. Here's where China is often misunderstood again. Um, a lot of media and some politicians would portray Chinese government as giving a ton of money to a Chinese company so it would compare um, advantageously to an American company. Again, I'm not saying there are not examples of that, but I'm telling you in AI that is not the case. All the companies, the five uh, unicorns we funded, are all privately funded. They didn't take any government money. In fact, the government didn't fully jump into AI until about a year ago. So all that came in the private sector. But when the Chinese company, uh, government does come in, I have to acknowledge they add a lot of value. I'll give you three examples of value they add. The first is just setting the tone. Uh, because China has a strong government, when the central government says AI is important, people listen. So banks are more open to buying AI. Um, local governments are more open to doing things related to AI. And then th there are environments that that creates. One of the companies we, we funded found that after this plan came out, more banks were willing to buy their products. 
So that is one positive thing, setting a tone. This plan actually doesn't come with any money. This plan is just setting the tone. Okay? Um, a lot of it is misunderstood uh, in the West. Um, the second thing is that um, China has generally a techno-utilitarian policy. What does that mean? It means when a new technology comes out, the Chinese government will say, let's not regulate it. Let's see what happens. And then if problems happen, they'll regulate it. If big problems happen, they'll shut it down. I'll give you three examples. Mobile payment. In the US, if, if someone were to say, we're going to do mobile payments, we're going to ignore Visa, MasterCard, American Express, we're going to compete against them. Well, you can imagine what's going to happen next. The credit card companies are going to lobby. They're going to claim, you know, technology companies can't be trusted. Only credit card companies have experience, right? You can't trust Facebook with your money. You can trust Visa. You can imagine all those messages will go up to Capitol Hill, and then there will be different hearings, and, you know, who knows if that will get approved or not. In China, the government basically says, well, Tencent, Alibaba, uh, doing things like credit card, let's give them a chance. And then when they prove trustworthy, mm, let's give them more chances. And three years later, the credit card companies are gone. So that's what happened. But it doesn't mean Chinese government doesn't regulate. <clears throat> there are cases where China regulates, like P2P lending. That is setting up a platform where any of you can loan money to any of the other of you. And that, obviously, there are lots of potential risks. And they try to uh, roll it out and then let people do it and found there was a lot of fraud. So then they regulated it by requiring license. Uh, there are also examples like cyber currency, which is very hot here, a little bit controversial in China. Um, when they let it go out for a while, but pretty soon they found it became um, really the, lo the love of the, uh, the, the, the fraudulent activities, fake ICOs, uh, even in the countryside, you know, poor old village ladies were buying ICOs. And they said, well, how are we going to deal with that? Um, they just shut it down. So right now, cyber currency is not legal. ICO is not legal in China. So it's not unregulated. It's just techno-utilitarian. Give technology a chance. Regulate it only when necessary. That is an interesting policy that's worthy of studying. Don't have to adopt it here, but interesting to study. And then finally, the last thing is <coughs> infrastructure building. So private companies fund private AI companies. Private VCs fund private... AI companies. However, uh, the government should do things that private companies cannot do. So what might that be? Building, how about building a new city the size of Chicago that has autonomous driving, bu uh, roads built in? Or building a new highway that has sensors to make autonomous driving safer? Or a new s part of a city, 10 square kilometers, with two layers, one layer autonomous driving, one layer normal driving? Or another city where it's also downtown, two layers. One layer, top layer is humans and pets and uh, bicycles. Bottom layer is cars. And that means the cars won't hit people. And, and also means the lighting will be very standard. So the Tesla accidents like that won't happen. So which way is right? We don't know. See, the Chinese local governments are like little entrepreneurs. They're each doing a little startup. And they try new things. Very expensive, billion dollar projects. But the one, once something is proven to work, it'll be standardized and used nationally. So I think that's a very powerful weapon. Now, some of you may still say, hey, that's still disadvantaging Chinese entrepreneurs because you're helping them uh, get technology out there faster. But one could also say President Eisenhower, when he built the US uh, highway, had the same intention and same effect. So anyway, I'm not a policy expert, just explaining what actually happens in those cases. Just as a side note, um, the U.S. Truckers Union appealed to President Trump and Secretary Chow not to let autonomous trucks be tested on highways. So imagine what the impact of that might be, is that U.S., which is ahead in autonomous driving, is kind of pulling back, giving less chance to the one part of autonomous driving that can be launched the fastest, because highway is a lot easier than local roads and downtown. Um, a, a logical government uh, ought to let trucks and highways go first. Um, but one that's concerned with truckers' jobs may not. But one has to weigh the value of truckers' job versus the technology edge. I mean, if I were, if I were the decision maker, I would um, let, keep the technology edge and then finding ways for truckers to become retrained 
to other jobs or even give social welfare and subsidies. But, um, but it seems in this case, one is pushing forward, one is pulling backwards. So to end this section, uh, I, if I were forced to give a zero-sum score, I would say in implementation and value extraction, China is a little bit behind today. Um, after all, it's only been two years. But in five years, I think China generally will be ahead. Uh, the only exception is in business AI because China business data is not well data warehoused compared to U.S. banks and hospitals. So that's the score. But coming back to the, my real argument is that there is no zero-sum game here. Uh, why is there a zero-sum game? The Chinese money is funding the Chinese companies selling to Chinese consumers. The American money is funding the American companies selling to American consumers. They're not even in the same market. There is not even a consumer that would consider Chinese AI versus US AI. There are parallel universes, so there is not a zero-sum game. What the American government wants is American people to have a better life, make more money, feel happier. The Chinese government wants that for the Chinese citizens. They're not in a zero-sum game. This is not a land grab fighting over uh, Alsace-Lorraine between you know, Germany and France or fighting over oil in the Middle East. This is not, AI is not a limited resource where the more AI, US has, the less China has. This is not a zero-sum game. Both can learn and grow. They're not even you know, after the same markets and customers. So this, so, but everyone asks this, so I have to do it. <laughs> so the forces now, I think there are many. So the, I think the key point now is that with US and China as dual engine driving AI forward, AI will make a lot more progress, faster progress than mobile or internet because you, there are two engines, not one engine driving it. The seven giants are hiring, training a lot of people with a lot of data. A lot of funds are out there. Uh, uh, SoftBank has $100 billion. And uh, new technologies are emerging with more apps that are coming. So what this means that is that AI is arriving probably faster than PwC estimates, which is $15.7 trillion added to the global GDP by the year 2030. Um, I'm usually a more optimistic uh, predictor, so I give you here a more pessimistic number. But even this number is huge, $16 trillion. That is the GDP of US, uh, oh, sorry, of um, <clears throat> China plus India. So that's how much in just a mere 12 years this will bring about. But AI will also cause a lot of unprecedented challenges. Um, you in the US have seen so much of privacy, security, and bias. Uh, I won't go into these areas. They're covered a little bit in my book, but I think um, the biggest issue is increased wealth inequality. This graph shows pre-AI pre days, 1990 to 2015, the top 2% um, of the US um, wealth earners and the bottom 90%, which is the majority of the people. You can see the 2% exceeded the bottom 90% in the year 1995, and the gap continues to grow. One could attribute to that possibly the ICT, computer, uh, internet, mobile revolution that created a lot of um, techno um, tycoons and also uh, reduced the average income of many uh, middle class and uh, lower middle class workers. And AI will only exacerbate that because imagine if monopolies or, or powerful companies used to hold their monopoly or a powerful position by what? By technology, by brand, by resource, by um, entry barrier, <clears throat> or by customer affinity. But now when you have AI, you actually have AI to, to reinforce the strength of your product because your product is trained on more data. So how can someone compete against you as a new entrant when they have less data? So that means so the wealthy will get wealthier. What about the poor? Well, that comes to my main other point in my book is that job displacement represents the largest threat that will, uh, uh, that, that will happen. And if we think about what the single area, single domain prodigy AI can do, that AI can in one domain do a brilliant job better than people, that means the repetitive tasks and people will be replaced by AI as will the routine jobs, as will the optimizing jobs in something like 5, 10, 15 years. Some jobs are reasonably safe. 
but, uh, but, but there are not that many of those jobs. And these things are not future projections. These are headlines from Wall Street Journal, Financial Times. Um, there are robotic hamburger flippers that are being developed, replacing one by one uh, the individual worker. This is a machine made by one of the companies we fund. It is a pastry scanner. So, you know, you go to pastry shops, a tray full of tasty croissants, and then the cashier hits the price of each one. Now, computer vision can do that. And then the, the price comes up and is charged against your phone. This is already running in Beijing. We were so happy with the result, we not only invested in the company that built the machine, we invest in the pastry shop because they showed us the p and and you can see the cost of a pastry shop. The pastries cost nothing to make, the, uh, and they're made in the central um, kitchens. The cost of running a pastry shop is the real estate plus the people, and the people are not needed for pastry shops. They don't, I mean, they don't provide much service. They're just there to hit buttons, and the machines can do it much more quickly. And the cost of this device, you know, as you know, Amazon Go is what, $10 million or something to create? This is $800 a piece. And it's a one-time cost, and, and you don't need a cashier ever. So that's the speed at which this AI tidal wave is coming. And they're not just coming at one machine replacing one cashier, one burger flipper level. They're coming faster. This is another company we invested in. It is called F5 Future Store. And you see there's no people in it. When you walk in, it scans your face, um, and then you have a wall of icons. The icons are all food that you can buy, um, beef noodle, a drink, a salad, and then the robot makes it. Where's the robot? The robot is here. See, the store is this wide, and then this part is the robot. It's not actually not a robot. It's just a giant machine that's got the broiler, fryer, and everything, and it's got packages of things. It mixes them together, and then an average meal is about $2 and compared to McDonald's, which is $5. So think how many Chinese users will prefer genuine Chinese food at 40% the cost of, uh, of a McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken. So what happens to job displacement in that case? Well, have we displaced jobs? Of course we have. To the extent that these types of stores take 50% market share in the Chinese fast food, well, McDonald's and KFC will surely have to lay off half of their workforce, right? But yet, it's not as though McDonald's or KFC laid off their workers. It's through an industry disruption, and that's the power of AI. Here's another white-collar example. Citi has issued a warning to, that it would replace, uh, would actually use AI to replace about 10,000 of their 20,000 operational staff that is essentially do quantitative work because machines are better at it. That's one-on-one -on -one displacement. What about this as an example? Toteo is a Chinese company. It's a $75 billion Chinese company, media company. You've probably not heard of a $75 billion media company for a long time. This is a company that has no editors. It is, um, well, it's a little scary, but I have to tell it like it is. It is a Facebook news feed on steroids. It is super optimized to maximize your number of minutes on this news app. I am not endorsing this app, but I am saying that it is it has an average per user time of 72 minutes per user per day. So imagine the total number of minutes that Chinese users read news. If 50% are reading this type of news, or American users reading Facebook news feed, that is so much less traditional media or traditional news site that they read. Therefore, traditional news sites and media will have to lay off half of their editors. I mean, we all know a lot of great editors. No self-respecting traditional media would ever hire a robot editor. Uh, we know that. However, they're not hiring them, but they're being squeezed from the auto automation AI side. Now, of course, I personally believe Newsfeed and Total should do a much better job than they do than optimizing minutes per user, and, and that will evolve. But I think I'm using it just to illustrate that without any voluntary displacement of editors. Editors' jobs will get squeezed. So what this means is there will be very few jobs available for many people looking for jobs, and that is the very difficult situation. However, a little bit of relief is that if we think about what AI cannot do, creativity is one of them. There is actually another, and that is compassion. And when I use the word compassion 
uh, to actually cover compassion, empathy, human-to-human -human touch, and trust. And we just don't trust robots to do certain things. And those are jobs that can be created in large quantities. So if we now rethink about this picture, if we have creativity as the x-axis, there should be a y-axis that actually has the compassion, empathy, and um, uh, human connection type of jobs. And you move these jobs around, and you'll see that while the lower left is in danger of being displaced, there are actually a lot of jobs on the upper left that might have greater opportunities of hiring people. That includes, you know, think about your own situation. Would you want a robot to be your beauty consultant, wedding planner, right? How about tour guide um, and uh, elderly companion, concierge, bartender, uh, social worker, psychologist, psychiatrist? Clearly not. And what about jobs like nurses um, and uh, teachers? Uh, clearly not. Uh, there are also jobs that will evolve. The future of the doctor may be as follows. The diagnosis is probably better than by an AI tool. But if doctor's job remains as a human interface to uh, tease out of the patient, how are you doing? Uh, how are you feeling? Are you feeling any pain? Did you have night sweat? Uh, what's your family history? How about your parents? Did they have this? That kind of things, it takes human connection to connect to get out of the patient and then provide the comfort, confidence, and that will increase the patient's chance of recuperation and survival. We all know the, um, that people, um, when they have confidence, they're more likely to be cured. So that is the symbiosis of doctors and the analytical engine. And also, when we, when we have that kind of a doctor, it's actually more like a nurse practitioner with an extra EQ training. And the doctor's job suddenly becomes much lower cost to fill. Um, instead of 10 years, 12 years of experience, maybe four years. And then the cost of medical care goes down. The number of doctors goes up. They don't make as much money as they do now, but there will be many more of them. So that might be a path in the future for the, for the bottom left quadrant to go to the upper left quadrant. You could imagine someone in a customer support job going back for a nursing degree or a, or a um, um, uh, basically a consultative type of um, uh, nurse practitioner degree. That is conceivable, whereas going to become a scientist may be quite hard. Another type of job that might change is a teacher. A, teacher's, a lot of a teacher's job may, may change. Uh, the components that are repetitive, grading homework, drills, exams, can be done by robot, by, by AI. The teacher can be more the one-on-one -on -one mentor to provide the help. And maybe rather than a 50 to 1 student to teacher ratio, we'll have 5 to 1. Then teacher can, then, then, then education can be brought to more people, can be more personal, more helpful, um, and, and that can be many more of them. And, and if we want to go one step further, why can't a parent who chooses to stay home as the homeschool teacher get paid as a homeschool teacher? So that, again, because if you think about the one-on-one -on -one mentor, who better to do that than the parent? But the parent has a job, they can't do that. But if they're uh, laid off in this job, but if they said, I'm going to be a homeschool teacher, I'm going to prove I do a good job, maybe there can be some subsidy. Take as a final example, the elderly caretaker. We know in America there are something like a million job openings as an elderly caretaker. They are not filled. Why not? They're not paid enough. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to tax the ultra-rich who get the top 2% and find a way Rather than, as UBI, give it to everybody, maybe to incentivize people to take the elderly caretaker job. Because as our longevity increases, people over 80 need five times as much care as other people. And there will be many more people over 80 in all countries. And therefore, that is a growing job category. And more people would do it if only there would be higher pay and greater social status. So those are the changes we need to think that job, that is, it's not just a simple matter of giving money to people like UBI. It is about people um, having, uh, needing a job to feel fulfilled in their lives. Uh, it is also about a change of thinking about our social contract, that our pay is not simply based on our economic contribution, but also social contribution. 
those are some big changes that need to happen over time. But to conclude on this slide, the four quadrants basically equate to lower left is going to be taken over by AI. That is just not going to continue. The lower right, these are the scientists, the columnists, the uh, script writers, the, the movie makers. They will use AI as a tool to enhance human creativity. So it's a symbiosis. And then on the upper left, AI will do the analysis. Human will provide the warmth, the comforting. Uh, and that's also a human AI symbiosis. And of course, upper right is a safe job because it magnifies human creativity and compassion. So when people tell you about AI job displacement is merely symbiosis, that's only half right. They tell you it's merely replacement, that's only hard part of the picture. So there is the blueprint of how human and AI will coexist. In the book, there's more details, but this is the simplified version that I can describe here. And so AI, I think, is just really like electricity. It will empower a lot of things. AI people are actually very open and sharing. Despite all these talks about trade war and things like that, I know that Chinese and American AI researchers are really good friends. They share everything. There is the uh, archive.org uh, where all the papers are published instantaneously. People even open share their, their uh, source code on GitHub. And in China, we also have open data like AI Challenger and, uh, and Decamp. So these are all efforts that shows the AI people are sharing in general and that we really don't want to be thought of as a weapon and certainly don't want to be thought of as a zero-sum game. So the global community, I think, is the same way. How do we solve some of the problems about jobs and, this, and security? Uh, I think there's a lot of wisdom globally, and globalism can bring all this back um, if we kind of become more generous and sharing. Uh, Israel might have some ideas about AI security. Korea might have some idea about gifted and talent education. Um, Japan and Switzerland might have some idea about craftsmen as a future job. Canada and the Netherlands might have ideas about volunteerism. So all this ought to come together to solve the crisis that we might face in the next 20 years. So we've talked a lot about 20 years. I'm going to conclude by thinking more like 50 years. The 20 years will be very exciting, very hard, very challenging, lots of opportunities, lots of wealth, and lots of problems to overcome. But if we get through this 20 years, the next 50 will be really amazing. Because if we really look back, a lot of the social contract and the work ethics might just be wrong. So in 50 years, when we look back, I hope that we'll realize two things. The first is that AI is actually serendipity. It's coming here to take away the routine jobs so that we can think about what it means to be human. Because we're surely not placed on this earth by our maker to do repetitive jobs. It's a little bit insensitive to think that in the next 20 years because we've got to get over it. But in 50, we will finally realize, imagine if you were our maker. You'd be very frustrated after thousands of years. We're still stuck here thinking our job, our work, our life is about working. We haven't gained any wisdom. And industrial revolution has further forced us to think about uh, jobs being the meaning of our lives. So the maker is probably very, very frustrated and said, okay, I'm going to send you AI, <laughs> right? <laughs> AI is going to take away those routine jobs so you'll start to think what it is that makes us human. And then lastly, I think people worry about AI, about all the challenges, but I would say not to worry because AI is just a tool that we as humans possess the only ability to have free will and determine what the future holds for us. So there will be an ending to the story of AI, and it is we, the humans, who will write it. Thank you. Dr. Kaifu, I have a question regarding, uh, uh, earlier I mentioned that uh, across globe we have seven superpowers, uh, big companies across US and China. Uh, I'm just curious, honors, from your perspective, why the superpower didn't emerge from other great economies like UK, Germany, or Japan? Okay, I think the, the markets are too small, and I think the entrepreneurial ecosystem is very critical. Um, I think UK, Japan, Israel, uh, France, uh, Canada actually all have a lot of brilliant researchers, but I think the markets are too small, so they couldn't do the China model, and then their um, VC and entrepreneurial ecosystem somehow didn't get going. 
Sometimes it's just serendipity, right? In Silicon Valley, there was the uh, Fairchild, people who left Fairchild. There are people who started Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia, and they met each other, and then the semiconductor people taught the, um, the, the PC people, who taught the software people, who taught the internet people, who taught the mobile people, who taught the AI people. So now Silicon Valley is vibrant. And China, I describe how China got to be. So sometimes you just have this, it's like human civilization, right? Somehow it formed in a few regions. It didn't in other places. And I think US and China were just blessed at the right times. They were able to build the ecosystems. And to rebuild it at this time, by another country is too hard, especially when they don't have the market size. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we have another question over here. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, um, thanks, that was an interesting talk. Um, my understanding is that deep learning is pretty brittle. Uh, I can think of two problems as adversarial examples, and also that if it hasn't been trained on something, then it, or it hasn't seen something, then it can't reason, uh, the, the current methodologies can't, can't handle that. And you're, some of the things you were expressing were ideas that seem to involve some sort of analysis. So could you maybe elaborate on um, how we can get to that point or where you see uh, the next step beyond deep learning or extensions of deep learning can actually do what we would consider to be more intelligence than pattern matching? Sure, sure, thank you. Um, are you a research, AI researcher? Uh, in my spare time. <laughs> yeah, great, <laughs> yeah, me not, too. Not really. <laughs> yeah, no, you're very much right. I think deep learning is, is very brittle. This is why I said the more data, the better. This is assuming we don't come our brittleness then more data is bliss. That's kind of an assumption of the, of the China advantage. And, and actually in the future, things might change. Some breakthrough in transfer learning might take place so that models can be trained on very little data. Then China would lose that advantage. That might be an area of a breakthrough. Uh, in terms of the analysis, people have come up with very clever uh, variations of deep learning. There is uh, the GAN network, for example, as you know, for the ad adversarial training. There's reinforcement learning. So when I speak as uh, deep learning, I actually mean the conglomeration of similar technologies that all together can be mixed and matched. So I, I did some simplification. But those things, as you know, evolved after deep learning sort of to patch the holes. Right. So this is a projection of the next 15 years in a whole patching kind of way to glue together solutions for the jobs and opportunities that we have. Um, it, what it doesn't do is, uh, I don't think I have any idea self-consciousness can be done, emotion, common sense, cross-domain reasoning, uh, very deep planning, strategy, creativity. So I'm assuming these seven things don't get done, but other things somehow get patched one way or another. Okay, all right, okay. thanks a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> you touched a little bit on political systems. Mm -hmm. The difference between China and the U.S. Yeah. in developing AI. But what about the fears of this on control? Yeah. For instance, uh, Big Brother, yeah. knowing every single thing you do. Right. And so I would like to know, with these different political systems we have, right. what, what are your solutions on having individualism, having ability to do creativity, yeah. without constant control. Yeah, I, I think we've seen in uh, a lot of cases, including the Snowden case, that um, often governments can resist the temptation to mix security with um, surveillance, right? It's really kind of the two sides of the same coin because um, more surveillance gives more security, but it takes away freedom. And I, I think um, regardless of the form of the government, whether it's a democracy or not, the government does care about what, about its mandate to rule and about what people's concerns are. And I'd like to think whichever country, there is a feedback loop that countries uh, will get the feedback that some acts will be stepping over the line and that it will choose to self-correct. I mean, maybe that's being too optimistic, but I understand where you're coming from and I think uh, those are, um, uh, those are valid, valid concerns. And, uh, and I, think, um, uh, I, th I think government forms will evolve as AI evolves, and it's hard to predict um, which is going to influence which. Uh, I would say at this time, um, I don't see China or other countries having the kind of data and control that a big brother truly has. But I understand the concerns, but I like to believe 
that anyone who's governing um, realizes that he or she is earning the mandate uh, by understanding people's concerns and using it in the feedback loop. It may not be through voting, it might be through some other mechanism. You, one can have a glass half empty or half full, I understand. Mm -hmm. uh, so first of all, thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for uh, giving this talk to us. Um, yeah, so I guess while I was uh, listening to your presentation, uh, one of the things I noted was that a bunch of the Chinese companies you mentioned, um, other than you know, some of the major big ones like Alibaba and Tencent and whatnot, uh, were all a bunch of companies I'd frankly never heard of. And so, um, and I was thinking about that a little bit, and so, uh, you know, thinking through your talk, it seemed like, you know, maybe product market fit, uh, where some of these companies, maybe they can find great product market fit within China, but have much difficult, uh, more difficult time uh, expanding beyond the Chinese market for whatever reason. Um, so that's like sort of the cause I thought there. Um, and so while you know, I understand that likely uh, the researchers involved will be uh, having open communication and things like that, from, uh, but from a business perspective, do you think that um, it's possible that uh, at least from a product point of view, uh, a lot of these companies will remain kind of bifurcated between like the Chinese set of, uh, the set of like companies that have Chinese product market fit <coughs> and the set of companies that have Western product market fit? Yes. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, you must be a product manager. Uh, no, I'm a software engineer. Yeah? Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so there's a new rev idea that's not yet in the book, so you've uh, triggered me to share the idea. China is actually not one demographic. It's actually three demographics. The first, uh, we just think about the, the type of people and what they want. The first uh, layer is the, obviously the earliest adopter the most educated, wealthiest layer, that's probably somewhat similar to the U.S. Obviously, there are differences. Uh, what you say about product market fit is valid, but they're similar in types of, if you just measure uh, education and uh, time spent on you know, news versus games versus other things, if you measure those attributes, more similar to U.S. There's a second group, interestingly, probably similar to, but maybe three to five years ahead of Southeast Asia due to China's faster development. And then there's actually another third that most of you never think about. That's the poor part of China. That's probably three to five years of, of, ahead of Africa. So here's the interesting opportunity. Think about the export of the, these three groups abroad. The first group is going to have a very hard time because developed economies already standardize on American technologies. So every day they try, they have a hard time. So they don't try anymore. The second grouping um, actually is already going to Southeast Asia um, and getting some success. And then the third grouping is starting to go to Africa and getting some success. Um, and that also, some ver actually, there's a little bit of first and second grouping that's going to the Middle East. And interestingly, that matches the low priority areas for American companies. Where, I mean, think about any American company that's high tech, they're going to go after the highest ARPU, right? The highest ARPU is you, and the easiest effort and the largest earning. So that's obviously going to be U.S., English-speaking countries, developed countries, Europe, Japan, and so on, Australia, and so on. So U.S. will take that, and those are very big strongholds of U.S. But China is now going to the areas where there might be a chance. So, and in fact, in the third, in the three-tier picture, where the third tier is the innovative Chinese ideas, uh, where it's not based on American innovation or copycat, many of those are the second and third tier. So mm -hmm. I would project a future world where uh, China actually makes significant progress in Southeast Asia, um, um, Islamic world, and uh, Africa. Cool. I never thought about it that way. That's very interesting. Thank okay. you. Yes. Uh, 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 that's how we call you in China. Thank you. Uh, teacher Kefu. Uh, I'm Bill, uh, the founder of AI Camp. Uh, we are uh, AI-powered uh, 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 startup uh, provide the uh, AI trainings uh, for the AI developers. So we do this one in uh, US uh, for one year, and uh, recently we went in China, set an office in Beijing. Uh, of, uh, of course, we're going to face in some of the uh, competitions, uh, many of them uh, like uh, uh, the venture you uh, invested, uh, like uh, the Xuanxiang, Chuanzi, uh, Boke. So um, many of the companies that in China, they uh, failed or maybe not very successful. Uh, so 
uh, I'm just wondering, you know, do you have any uh, uh, kind of like the strategies or uh, suggestions that go to China market? Uh, These um, are American companies? Yes. The American By American, American Chinese? Uh, or yes, not I'm, the, I, I'm the founder. Uh, but you said many companies didn't succeed. Uh, some of them, like, you know, uh, we are not very successful, like, you know, eBay, uh, Amazon, or, you know, Microsoft in China, mm. they're not mm. very successful. Uh, one of the reasons probably, uh, I think you probably mentioned it before, you know. Uh, Parallel universe. Yeah, you know, the, the, yeah. the, 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 uh, the local, company, yeah. local teams yeah. probably don't have authority to make decisions. Uh, so we are thinking, you know, to let the local team to run, uh, we provide the tech technology yeah. uh, as, a, as a support. Yeah. Uh, I'm not yeah. asking, uh, no. you know, ask, looking for consultations, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. just more kind of like a top uh, Gen suggestions. Top general, suggestions, uh, yeah. okay, sure. Well, as I said, uh, U.S. and China have developed into parallel universes. Mm -hmm. It is very difficult for someone to travel to another parallel universe mm -hmm. and, accept and expect to get acclimated very easily, mm -hmm. right? assimilated very easily. Mm -hmm. And that is why, you know, people ask about, can Google succeed in China? Mm -hmm. Um, I think the question isn't about government regulations or Google's determination or uh, whether they should do censorship or not. I mean, those are, of course, ac academic questions you can ask. The fundamental issue is that Google, Amazon, or Facebook, even if they could fully enter China at this point in time, it would be too late because the alternate universe has already been built. Unless Google, Facebook, Amazon has a brand new product that matches the alternate universe such as Waymo, for example, hypothetically. Mm -hmm. so, so I think for your company, your companies may be similar. You've been in the U.S. too long. Mm -hmm. You're not deeply rooted enough. Mm -hmm. We have actually looked at and funded many of this sort of cross-border companies. Mm -hmm. They don't generally succeed because the cost of communication is too high. Mm -hmm. uh, the cultural differences is too large. And who's in charge is too complex mm -hmm. because the cross-border companies with founders like you, who have U.S. experience, will tend to want to be the CEOs, but love living in America and don't want to move back. Mm -hmm. And then, <clears throat> yeah, actually, as you said, to succeed in China, if China is your market, you actually need your CEO, decision maker, mm -hmm. and the largest shareholder in your founders mm -hmm. to be based in China. I think that is the issue. Um, I, 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 think, I, think the, I think the greatest value will come from, that doesn't mean the parallel universes don't have independent values. I think someone, um, for example, take myself as an example. I was a parallel universe traveler in 1998 with a lot of knowledge from the US. When I went to China, I found that those knowledge was very useful to China. Um, but only if I um, don't live in the US and live in China and fully integrate into the environment can I use that knowledge, right? I think similarly, if I were to move back from China now, knowing all that I know about the startups in China and the ecosystem, I bet I can found or help found a lot of very cool companies um, in the U.S. now, knowing what I know. But I think it's a commitment that if you're a parallel universe traveler that has learned a lot in universe A uh, and you want to leverage that in universe B, you have to A, commit to live in universe B, and then take all that you have and learn all, all, all you can quickly about Universe B and build a Universe B company but leveraging the knowledge you have from Universe A. Mm -hmm. Does that help? <laughs> kind of. Okay. Oh, thanks. Okay. Uh, by the way, we are working with uh, AI Challenger. Okay. We provide the, uh, the, the, the training. For Great. You. Thank you. Appreciate <laughs> it. So our artificial intelligence systems are rebelling and oh. we are running quite late so we have only time for just this one last question one last with question. apologies to those in line. Thank you for being here. So in your um, explanation of the job displacement and the, the way in which AI will become a symbiotic part of life, I think about the notion of democratization of AI, right? Making the powers of AI available uh, to others. So I work for a company called Sensing and we're working on democratizing entity resolution for the average person because being able to effectively do that particular job well has been very expensive and hard to enter on. Um, so when we think about that, there are a few core players that we talked about. What do you see in terms of more players coming about that allow the powers of AI for whatever your purpose is, for whatever your uh, objective is, to be made readily available to smaller companies, who need to accomplish a job and want to 
flourish as competitors, mm. but may not have the the staff, the gumption, the yeah. the money, the data to do the thing. Right. So you're talking about you know um, Google platform, Facebook platform, Microsoft platform, etc. Right. I, I think you know again you know if you're if you're a glass half full, you would say. If your gas have empty, you would say these giants are going to dominate us. If we use their platform, we're stuck helping them make money, and uh, they're going to dominate us. We'll never be able to have our own IP. Um, but I think if your glass half full, I would say that today there is quite a bit of competition among those three, plus Amazon, which added AI too. Mm -hmm. And I think we, if we are a little bit optimistic and hopeful, as long as there's competition, uh, they're going to be forced to be fairly open with us. I'm one of, I'm, I mean, we're, I'm one of you now, right? We're the weak ones. Um, just think about how open TensorFlow has become in light of the competition from Amazon and Microsoft and Facebook. So I keep telling my friends from those two weaker, three weaker giants that they got to keep pushing so that Google will keep TensorFlow open. I mean, if you look at, you know, Google is about as a benign a giant as you can get. However, if you look at Google's behavior in Android, it was very, very open, but when it dominated the world, it kind of started to pull things in. So this is, I think, unavoidable business behavior. When some company gets too powerful, nearly monopolistic, uh, they will be predatory to even their developers. Uh, Google is as benign as I have seen, but it's even unpreventable for them. So I think the only check and balance is for other giants to work really hard to give them a run for their money, um, and then we can hope for um, a multi-platform world in which we smaller developers can keep using what they have. I do think in the long term it is impractical for small companies to to manage the kind of stack that they have managed. So using it, right now I actually think TensorFlow is relatively open, so I think it is okay to use any of those platforms. Um, but, but there are a few tricks built in. Uh, TensorFlow's voting uh, does favor Google, ultimately. So they do have a final switch they can turn at some point. Um, so I think we have to just cautiously be optimistic and hope multiple platforms exist. Um, and of course, final thing I'll say is depending on your particular application, there might be enough open source that you can cobble something together. I do think there is another possible platform potentially emerging with all the developer community of the academics and weaker people like ourselves uh, if we continue to contribute, maybe something like Linux can emerge again as an open form of AI. Uh, I'm currently a little bit skeptical of that, but I think we, we should give it a try. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. And uh, that's all the time we have. Sorry for the folks over there. Dr. Kaifu Lee, thank you so much. <laughs>